before I begin on my way here this evening, I was reflecting on last night's RTE Investigates program in respect of the failures in the childcare sector and in the manner in which our economy serves our people. And I think what last night's show illustrates to all of us who've seen it, and I'll come on to some of this in my contribution later on, is that we have an economy that doesn't serve our people. As a father of four children, a person who lives not far from here, one thing that would keep myself in roaching up at night is not knowing if our children were safe when we were out working. And what we witnessed last night was what happens when childcare is reduced to a business designed solely for profit with little or no enforcement or regulation or standards. And it was shocking. But it comes after similar programs on nursing homes and similar programs in regards to services for people with disability. And when it comes to protecting our children, our parents, our family members with special needs, in my view, Fianna Gael and Fianna Fáil have privatised essential services and outsourced service provision to the detriment of common decency, based on the false premise and the assumption that it is cheaper and more convenient to do so. I strongly believe that childcare should never be just a business I strongly believe that the care of our elderly should never be just a business. I strongly believe that the roof over one's head should never be just abandoned to property developers or landlords. And the reality is that it is a false economy because ultimately people suffer and the taxpayers end out forking out more. The role of government must be to say that enough is enough and accept that privatisation of essential services that our people rely on, the likes of what we've seen under Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil, have fostered, will never provide proper, decent services to all of our citizens. It will only put more money into the pockets of millionaires. And when it comes to housing, we see that very clearly, where they are in hock to private developers and landlords. We see it in terms of our health care with a private and public system. And we see it in the lack of regulation and enforcement in banking and the insurance sector where ordinary people are being fleeced every single day of the week. So not only has the state, in my view, a role to play, it is a responsibility to act. It has a responsibility to provide essential services to the highest of standards and at a fair price. And it must be the role of the state in promoting the development of an economy that it serves everyone and all to take a side and to take a stand on what is right and what is good. These are the values that I believe that we all need to abide by. Stepping up and providing where there are failings, rectifying wrongs where they've been made and taking charge where the state has abdicated its responsibility. In my view, that is the big challenge that we face, particularly when the economy is doing better, and it is doing better. So the question that we pose here in this session is what could go wrong? Well, the answer is plenty. With Brexit chaos to our east and to the west, we have Trump dictating trade and foreign policy through late night tweets. But we also have other threats, and I want to focus on one of those. Global efforts of many varieties to tackle international avoidance and profit shifting may have just about turned the egg timer on the industrial policy in this state of over-reliance on FDI. With it has come a renewed focus that has rightly been placed on the volatility of the temporary boom of corporation tax receipts that are collected by the Irish Exchequer. And all of these threats and risks undermine our ability to develop a strategy for the future which pro proposes and can resource solutions to the profound social and ecological issues of our time. Indeed, any such strategy that we develop needs to take into account of the position of the domestic economy, which teeters precariously between fire and ice, a trend towards overheating in one end, and in the other end, a Brexit-induced shock. 
to output. And I believe that I want to also start by pointing out the wasted years that I believe that we will all look back on these last few years as having been. We have the fastest growing economy in the European Union, but we've made zero progress to universal health care. We have corporations and our banks have experienced boom time profits, yet there are 10,000 people homeless in this state and as referred to earlier, including 4,000 children And we are getting the very fundamental issues wrong because we have done things the wrong way around. We have built a society to serve an economy instead of the other way around. And now we are facing deep uncertainty with a downturn of some sort probable. And how prepared are we today is the question. Have we built the homes that are needed to house our people? Have we built a, a health system that is fit for purpose and that can care for you when you fall ill? Have we invested in the education systems that are the foundation blocks in which any economy and any society needs to be built on? And my contention is that this country has failed to do those things things, but is also making a lot of the same mistakes that we have done pre the previous crisis. So let's just look at tax. We have over €10 billion now collected in corporation tax last year. 45% of that 45% of that 10 billion comes from just 10 companies, 10 firms, nine actual groups of companies. And despite the claim from the Minister for Finance that this over-concentration and volatility of corporation tax receipt is a priority for him, the concentration is getting worse. The year before it was 39%, now it is 45%. We have the Irish Fiscal Advisory Council, which Seamus is chair of, telling us that between 3 and 6 billion euro of this or up to 50% of the corporation tax receipts that we collect are unsustainably high. They're at risk in the long term or medium term. And government policy has relied on these taxes to pay for uh, day-to-day current spending. Indeed, last year, the big hole that was in health, that it was filled by a boom and bonanza that was unexpected in relation to corporation tax. And moreover, we have gross tax take is now double what it was in corporation tax than 10 years ago. And no one in this room will be alien to the fact that we in Sinn Féin, including many, many others, have made observations about the folly of building public services spending on the bedrock of a sand that is our corporation tax base. Indeed, it is dominant discussion regarding the public finances. But this justified focus and comparisons to pre-crash Stamp duty disguises, in my view, the real story and source of volatility in the Irish economy. There is a structural imbalance in the Irish economy of which corporation tax receipts are not the cause, indeed they are merely the symptom. A productivity gulf has opened up between hyper-productive FDI firms based in the capital and SME and micro firms which comprise over 95% of enterprises in the state. Simply put, small and medium enterprises do not have the capacity to compete with multinational wages and benefits, nor do they face the prospects in which they will be able to do soon. Despite accounting for 95% of all enterprises in the state and about 70% of all pr- uh, private sector employment, domestic SMEs contribute just 35 to 40% of value added. We can see from the recent work in relation to the Nevin Institute They estimate that productivity in Dublin, where a lot of the FDI is located, is some 89% higher than the EU average, the EU 15. But when we look at the border region and the Midlands region, we are half as productive as compared to the EU 15. With these two economies coexisting, we have a situation where public finances are being focused and, in my view, determined by when the next election is likely to take place. So we have Fine Gael who are promising to hollow out our tax base. Prior to the last election, the posters were abolish the USC. Leo Varadkar held them, his government colleagues held them. That would mean a four billion hole in the public finances today. They've dropped that agenda and then before another election they said they were gonna merge the USC with PRSI and that's been quietly parked and isn't been implemented And now the new rallying call is that we're going to cut between 2.2 to 3 billion euro of taxes for those of us who are lucky enough to pay the higher rate of tax. In my view, none of this 
is possible given the risks and the concerns that I have outlined. While at the same time the government is planning Budget 2020, they're still not budgeting or accommodating or, or factoring in the Christmas bonus, which will take up half of the amount of space, half of the amount of discretionary spending that will be available in that budget. And the trends so far suggest that there will be another overrun in health, which means that there will be a need for a supplementary budget. And as we heard last night or yesterday evening at the McGill Summer School about runaway capital projects, if this trend continues and the government not being able to manage major capital projects and if they continue to run at the rate that they've been running, the Irish Fiscal Advisory Council tell us that that would mean a cut of about €2 billion Euro on the smaller projects each year over the next number of years. These are our schools, our, 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 our waterworks, um, our, our extensions to, to our community hospitals and so on. I've already touched on the risks, so let's stop and ask ourselves, what type of government looks at the risks of Brexit, looks at the ca climate chaos, looks at the unsustainable possible corporation tax bubble, looks at the warnings from its own watchdog and the state of our public health, and decides now is the time for deep and long-lasting cuts to personal taxation. In my view, this isn't the time. Indeed, to address these challenges, we require more resources. And those resources can be harnessed through policies, among others, such as ending the various, very generous tax credits for high earners, taxing wealth, and making your banks pay tax. And yes, the multinationals can, can contribute more by closing some of the top tax loopholes that a number and a, few, a selected few are able to avail of. Huge property investment funds, some of the biggest landlord, the biggest landlord in the state with thousands of property, pays no tax on its rental income, pays no corporation tax because it is structured in that way. It has thousands of property. They are un effectively untaxed. Billions of euro in intangible assets have been onshored into the state. The cost of doing so by these corporations are offset against their taxable profits. So they reduce their, taxable, their tax liability in some cases close to zero. And this has partially been addressed in the previous finance bill, but not fully. Doing so, if we were to address this fully, as has been advocated by the expert who commissioned the report, Seamus Coffey, it would bring in 750 million euro next year and each year for the next number of years. But the government doesn't want to do that. The impact of Brexit, I heard you, has been well discussed at this school and indeed in, in, in previous schools. I think two years ago it was the subject of, of, of my discussion. But in terms of the Irish economy, the latest figures suggest that a no-deal Brexit will result in a €6 billion Euro hit to the Irish economy in the first year. Within five years, the hit to the Irish economy will be €28.5 billion. Euro. It is predicted that the fallout of this will result in between 55 and 85,000 job losses in this state and 40,000 job losses across the border in the north. And they are just headline figures because what is behind all of those headline figures are the real effects to businesses. Businesses will close. In some cases, individual mortgages will go unpaid. There will be cuts to public services as governments struggle to balance the books and immigration will return to certain parts of our state. And there's been much speculation over the last three years, but we are now closer than ever. We are now tethering on the brink of a no-deal Brexit, particularly with the election of Boris Johnson and his appointment of a Brexiteer cabinet. He refuses to recognise that the backstop is the insurance policy that allows Britain to leave the European Union while it protects trade on an island-wide basis and crucially protects the peace settlements in which Britain is a co-signatory to and ensures that we don't see a return to a hard border on the island of Ireland. But despite the massive impact on Brexit that it will have to our economy and the spillovers in society, the summer economic statement that was just published about a month ago contained very little with regard to the possible policy, fiscal policy response. We in Sinn Féin have outlined that there's a need for a Brexit support fund and what this would do would be to provide active support to communities and industries most at risk to lift capital investment and our economic fortunes in a time of instability. We've also outlined in great detail how the EU can mitigate the damage of Brexit 
and the Irish government, we believe, and we will support them in doing this, must demand and must win the help of the EU through changes to the EU fiscal rules that will curtail our ability to support industries in the context of a no-deal Brexit. They need to secure an exemption to state aid rules. They need to leverage the structural funds to fight Brexit's impact. And a new Brexit solidarity fund needs to be created. And we need to broaden the scope of the European Globalisation Fund so that workers laid off as a result of Brexit can benefit from retraining and upskilling. The evidence shows that sustained and targeted public investment backed by stable taxes can expand our output potential and drastically it can improve our quality of life for Irish citizens. And the same is true of the state's response to climate action, which to date has been an abject failure and among the worst among the world's highest income countries. Building our green productive capital stock, creating high quality green collar jobs in areas that have suffered investment throughout to date can drive greater regional balance, regional balance while at the same time unleashing the island's potential as a world leader in, co- in coming green economy. In short... Sorry, uh, yeah. I, I, they've given me a bell to remind people when they're coming... Too close, close to the end, yeah, yeah I understand. Akerji, when we outline the risks on the horizon, it is important that we also recognise the opportunities. And one of those is the debate that is well underway in the North in relation to the creation of a new and agreed Ireland and utilising the provisions of the Good Friday Agreement to make that happen. The debate on Irish unity isn't just confined to the North. It is raging, it is happening every day in the North, but it's not just confined to the North. It's also been much referenced by British politicians, including at the most senior level, including by the former Prime Minister, Theresa May. But it has been far more muted here in the South with some notable exceptions. One of those I want to pay tribute to, someone I shared a panel at the first time I spoke at the McGill Summer School in 2010, nearly 10 years ago, that the late Noel Whelan. He was an active participant in events to discuss Irish unity, how we would shape the future, how we would make new relationships on this island of Ireland. And I was shocked and saddened to learn of his untimely passing. Indeed, he he just tweeted me a number of days before and I wasn't Aware that he was sick and I want to use this opportunity at McGill to extend my sympathy to his friends, his wife and his family and his untimely passing. I encourage you, the debate on Irish unity is happening. Some have participated, others haven't. But it's happening with or without us. And it is important that all of us, and especially those in a position of influence, to participate in meaningful and constructive manner do so. Today's focus is on risk. Sinn Féin's approach to risk such as Brexit disruption, uncertain global conditions and economic volatility at home is positive, radical and realistic. It's about uh, ensuring that there's no further erosion of our tax base. It's about investing in public services. It's about ensuring that we do not over-subsidise uh, private investors and financial institutions. It's rooted in public spending and investment and it's in, about ensuring that we have public services that meet people's needs. Yes, the economy is doing well, but there's also another serious risk and that is the risk that nothing will change. That risk is there for the families who are struggling to pay the back-to-school costs of their children in September. It's there for those that are living in fear that the monthly rent is wiping out their whole disposable income. It is there for the businesses who this week learned that they can't get insurance anywhere in Ireland. It is there for other businesses that have seen hikes in their insurance premium. And indeed, as the Cabinet comes to Donegal today and meets in Donegal, It is there for those of us who live in this county, a county which has got the highest level of unemployment, a county that has got some of the highest levels of deprivation, a county that has got the lowest lowest disposable incomes in the state, a county that is without basic infrastructure such as a train line, a county where the risk is that nothing will change. So as I conclude on my central point that what we have built and our building is a society that serves an economy rather than an economy to serve a society. We have placed core public services in the hands of the for-profit operators and we are living with the consequences. So I encourage you, we must change our policies or we risk losing a lot more than budget surpluses or positive growth figures on a page for my government.